and welcome everyone to World Vegan Vision Mumbai and its first online conference in 2021. My name is Ruchika Chitrabhanu and I warmly welcome you all today for the series of Awakening Souls. World Vegan Vision is a global non-profit organization based in New York, USA founded by Harshad Shah and his wife Malti Shah. And today I'll be talking about a path with heart. Let's take a minute to tune in. Let's get present with your experience. And we can all take a slow deep breath. All right. So where should we begin? Um I had the opportunity to go to a really interesting school as a kid, the school where we decided what we wanted to study. And uh, what was unique about this is that we would decide what we studied and then we would also evaluate ourselves on how we did on our own studies. So it's, a, it's what they call a free progress school. And it's based on the idea that children have these two innate drivers. One is imitation and one is constant questioning, curiosity. So if you just let these two innate drivers of imitation and curiosity, so for imitation, if you set a good example for them, and for curiosity, if you let them go and find their own answers, then we have done our bit as parents and teachers. And so I was fortunate to spend several years in a school like that. And I think one of the things that I got from that is recognizing the importance of values and also recognizing that ultimately there's nobody out there who has the final answer. We should be willing to question everything. In fact, I remember a cartoon once, there was a graffiti, big graffiti, which said, question everything. And people were admiring what a beautiful graffiti it is. And a few days later, somebody noticed somebody had put an extra graffiti at the bottom of that graffiti. And it said, why? <laughs> so uh, in, the, in today's session, I'd like to talk about how I began questioning things and how I came to a place that seems more wholesome to, to, to me at least. Uh, at the age of 16, I was introduced to meditation. I went for a meditation retreat and I was someone who had read a lot of books by that time. I was interested in spirituality, but I saw a big gap between my lived experience and all these concepts that I had learned. And meditation seemed to be an important answer because it showed me how at a conscious level I can think I want something, but ultimately it's the subconscious deeper mind that operates. And meditation, I began to find a way to work directly with this deeper mind. And I would find it like there's an invisible force field around me where I don't get so easily bugged by what other people say and do. It also made me more empathetic. So for example, uh, on my 16th birthday, or was it 17th birthday, 17th birthday, someone gifted me a little chick, a baby chick. And I was like, what is this about? She said, no, this is like a gift for you. So in my backyard, I let the chick grow up and we were very fond of this chick and run around. And one day uh, a hawk came, I think it was the eagle or a hawk, and it picked up this chick and it plucked out the head of the chick. 
my brother was so shocked he saw it actually happening i came a few seconds later he said right there on the spot i will never again eat a chicken and he said okay if that's what your choice i said well, if that's your choice i'll also never eat a chicken <laughs> <laughs> so in that on the spot with that one incident both of us became uh, vegetarian at that point and uh, so i went on to uh, practice meditation and uh, even became a teacher for children with meditation we learned very simple methods of meditating like for example being aware of the breath breath is something very universal you could be indian you could be american you could be hindu you could be christian uh, but the breath is something that's universal and the breath is happening now so when you're aware of the breath now you've come to a new neutra- neutral place because in breath there's nothing to hate there's nothing to like it just is so in experiencing your own breath you can come to a place of neutrality a place of clarity so this practice is something i would share and one thing i began to realize is i began to find that there is this ability to step back from one's thinking normally one's completely mesmerized by one's own thinking and completely hypnotized by it but i found this ability to step back and just witness my own thoughts and this gap is what i began to call it's the gap i think uh, this is a teaching by this famous um, victor frankl victor frankl talked about this that between stimulus and response is a gap is a space and this is where wisdom lives and that's what i discovered when i was 16 17 years old through meditation i could access this gap and in that gap i found through presence better choices were made it seemed that they were made by themselves they were not made by me they kind of happened life made those choices so went on to uh, go to college and uh, did an mba as well and worked for a short while and then i followed an in a uh, deeper guidance that i had intuition that i had that i need to know more about myself in a way so it's not just about knowing about the world and being successful in the world so i decided to leave my corporate job and i became a buddhist monk I lived as a monk for about 6 years in the forest tradition of Thailand and Sri Lanka. So the topic I've chosen for today a path with heart. It comes from this idea that don't just have an intellectual approach to life. Also include the heart. And the heart at least in the in the spiritual traditions is not just considered the seat of sentimentality or emotion. the heart is a balance between intellect and instinct so the head is intellect the belly or the gut is instinct and the heart is a beautiful balance of both of these it's intuition per se is only one and so one thing i found in my practice is as i just practice for example breath itself what is being being still little by little i detach from the idea that i'm in this and i want this and i want that to simply i am and answering an object here that is called being. purva paksha in so india we have this thing that destroyed the and the pot buddhi that is true chit is consciousness and ananda is bliss and what i recognized in my practice is that the basic truth which is common to all of us all humans all beings down to ants and bacteria the basic truth is existence there is existence you don't need scientific proof to validate that there is existence there is existence existence is to be conscious that one exists is blissful that's the idea so normally we are conscious of i am something but not just i am to be conscious of the simple fact that i exist this is blissful sat chit ananda and something quite remarkable happens it's like you've touched a part of your being which is something you have in common with all beings the word compassion for me means common passion the one cop common passion we share with all beings human and non human is we're all trying to escape suffering and we all want to be happy this is a common passion we share so when you touch that part of your being then something in you can really feel yourself in all beings and in all things this is something that may sound very spiritual but it's actually quite accessible to all of us so in my case i came across a book in my library in when i was a monk and uh, it was called diet for a new america 
by John Robbins. And John Robbins was the heir to the Baskin Robbins empire. <laughs> he was all said to be the next uh, one of the family members who would be running that business. However, he wrote a book, which uh, in a way turned everything upside down. He wrote a book called Diet for a New America. And the first part of the book is just heartwarming, touching stories about the intelligence of animals. And not just dogs and cats. All animals have their own intelligence. Chicken have a pecking, chicken have a pecking order. And not just that, if you give chicken duck eggs, then there'll be surrogate pa parents to these ducks. And as the ducks grow older, they'll kick the ducks into water. Chicken themselves don't like going into water, but they'll have enough intelligence to kick these ducklings into water. That's the kind of intelligence chicken have. So when I talk about the, the intelligence of, of birds and of chicken and of cats and of dogs and of fish and such heartwarming stories, I was so moved to read those stories. The second part of the book talked about how much we are misinformed about the reality. I would call it the dirty underbelly of the food industry. And I heard, I learned so much about the different practices that go on. They go on, of course, they go on in America, but they go on all over the world now because America kind of leads the way. These developed countries lead the way for the rest of the world. So when I began to read that, for example, most of the antibiotics in the world are given to animals, not to humans. And I began to read just the large amount of land and water usage that, that, that is used just for taking care of these animals, growing these animals. And also the condition in which they're kept and the breeding that happens. And when I, the more I read about this, it was, I couldn't help many times when I was reading those chapters, I would break down and start crying. Something in me was very moved. I didn't even realize this was going on in our world. And the last part of the book talked about, yeah, so it talked about how the animals are treated. It talked about the impact on our health and all the, uh, the, you could say, distortions they are, which are fed to us from a very early age, or what's good for us and what's bad for us. And finally, the environmental impact of these choices. And what I got from that book is that every day people are voting with their forks and knives. They're voting with their dollar or their rupee. They're voting for what kind of world they want to have. And it became very clear to me that if I believe in compassion, if I believe in a peaceful, harmonious world, where we treat, each, we treat others the way we want to be treated, then I have no choice but to be vegan. In any case, I was vegetarian. And uh, not, as a monk, there was not much, especially in Sri Lanka, the monks were mostly vegetarian anyway. Although it's interesting, in Buddhism, monks are not always vegetarian. But you have a choice. So I, I was a vegetarian uh, for most of my time as a monk, except for some time when I was living in very remote places. But there wasn't much to eat. So I decided to go vegan. So I, did, I think 2006, I became vegan. And uh, right away, I noticed a tremendous improvement in my health. Uh, I used to have breakouts, a lot of breakouts in my skin, and that reduced. And I used to get, I mean, maybe once in four or five months, I'd get sick and began happening very rarely. And if I would get sick, I would recover very quickly. Uh, my digestion improved. I wouldn't get constipated. And I began noticing a general improvement in my overall health and my recovery times from you know any exertion that I would do. But more than anything else, I really felt in my heart a sense that I'm now living my values more completely. So in my case, it was a natural progression of uh, my meditation practice leading to a sense of just being and from that sense of being feeling my oneness with all beings and not a contrived compassion but a very natural compassion that all beings want to escape suffering all beings want to be happy and why would i do to any other being what i would never like done to me so this kind of clarity began emerging this kind of uh, it just began translating itself into my life and uh, yeah so that's been the journey this path with heart has to do with, you know, there's a lovely phrase that the longest journey in the world is the sacred pilgrimage from the head to the heart. And uh, it's really true that as, because we can all have all kinds of notions, all kinds of beliefs. But ultimately, when it comes down to simple things like kindness, Aldous Huxley, one of the brightest philosophers who wrote so many amazing books, uh, in the last few days of his life was asked about 
you know, you've lived such an amazing, intellectually rich life, you've written so many books. What would be the distillation, the summary of your life experience? And his answer was, just be more kind. Just be more kind. At the end of the day, just be more kind. How can we live in a way that's kinder? You know, every single person we meet is carrying an invisible burden. It's something I learned in psychology. You know, I studied psychology in college. And uh, it was amazing that with a few, few questions, you could take just about anybody and in less than 15 minutes, you could reduce them to tears because everyone's carrying such a lot of trauma. If you ask the right questions, pretty much anybody will be reduced to tears. That's how much baggage everyone's carrying. So then the question is, as I go through my day, as I go through my life, am I adding to people's burden? Or am I lightening their load? So one of my teachers had a nice intention. He said, anyone who comes in contact with me leaves feeling better than before, or the same as before, but not worse than before. Benjamin Zander talks about during the, the Holocaust, there was this sister, there was a girl and boy, brother, sister, and they were quite young kids. And uh, they were being transported in a train to what was the concentration camp. And the sister noticed that in the hustle bustle, her brother had lost one shoe. She what happened to your shoe? You know, I don't know, I dropped it somewhere. And she began shouting at him, how careless you are, how careless you are, you've lost your shoe, you lost your shoe. And she scolded him. A few minutes later, the train stopped. All men, including boys and kids, were separated and the women were separated. And that was the last time she ever saw her brother. She survived the concentration camp experience, the Holocaust. He didn't. And she made a vow to herself, never again will I say anything to anyone that would not stand as the last thing I ever said to them. And we don't know, is this sentence now the last sentence I'm ever saying to you? How can I know for sure? Is this time the last time we're ever meeting? So this introduces a different kind of urgency and attentiveness to everything that we do. The Buddha said, if you know that someone's dying, then it would not be easy for you to hold a grudge in your heart. You, chances are you let go. You'll not hold that grudge. We only hold a grudge in our heart because we assume they're going to live forever. <laughs> right? So like this letting go, the ability to let go. Another story I'm being reminded of is this woman, this is again during World War II. This woman was going in a train and she noticed two officials entered from the other end of the train compartment. And she recognized them. These are not ordinary officials. They were part of the secret police. This was in Italy. And this was Mussolini's secret police. So right away she began trembling and she began crying. And the gentleman in front of her said, what happened? Are you all right? Is something the matter? She said, these officials are checking papers and I don't have papers. I'm a Jew and I'm going from one safe house to another and they're going to catch me. So as the officials came closer and closer, checking everyone's papers, this woman was getting more and more frightened. And the man in front of her, to her surprise, began shouting at her and screaming at her and getting really upset with her. She's like, what's going on? And seeing the commotion, the two officers come and say, what's going on over here? And the man turns to the officers, says, officers, please take my wife away. Every day I remind her and every day she forgets to take her papers along. I'm fed up, please take her away. And the officers laugh, they show me your papers. And he shows his papers, he asks, get them. And they go on. And in one clean sweep, he has saved the life of this woman. And she is so stunned, she doesn't even know how to express her gratitude. He's just saved her life. And they reach the next stop and the man smiles. He doesn't even tell her his name and he leaves. It's a true story. So these moments stay with us. Even hearing the story, probably you were moved by the power of the story. And these moments are what life is ultimately about. I remember a heart-rendering moment. I was visiting a permaculture farm of my friend in Goa. And uh, she was showing us around and she showed us a, a, a calf. I said, what is this? She said, no, I was in the market recently, just a few days back. And uh, 
or just yesterday she was in the market and they, she saw these two men selling this calf she said, why are you selling this calf so they said he's a male calf and so it's quite clear. dairy industry doesn't want male calves right they have no use for male calves so uh, why are you selling it because they're hindu so they can't slaughter it they're hoping some person from another religion will come and slaughter it so she sees this cute little baby and she buys it from them she gets it home and this was such a cute little, cute little calf and we, so adorable all night the calf cried for its mother all night you we were sleeping there so all night you could hear the calf crying for its mother and when you see videos of this you find wherever the mother is the mother is also crying for the calf and uh, next morning we went to play with the calf and play be with the calf and all it was doing was it wanted to suck our finger suck our hand lick our hand we gave it a bottle of milk and she was drinking the milk such an adorable creature and most people don't re- don't realize the connection between their milkshake and their cheese and whatever else they have with the slaughter of this innocent animal so these connections it's not something you can really teach but when these connections start happening it's quite spontaneously it, the the penny drops i was sharing you know i don't really advertise this cuz i feel you know people will learn through my example but all my retreats for many years have been uh, completely plant based whole food plant based so there was one gentleman who attended he was a you know one of india's best photographers and he attended my retreat and he said why we only get eating this kind of food you know why don't we have meat and other things so i said yeah you know i've uh, i don't want uh, any animals to be hurt in the process of our joyful retreat he wasn't fully convinced but uh, a few months later he invited me to his home and he told me he had been commissioned by the up government up is one of the biggest states of india and to do a project on the dairy industry so he got to travel to the interior of up taking photographs for a campaign for the dairy industry and he wanted to tell me that just that going to the actual villages and seeing the way the cows are kept and seeing how this this stuff the body of a male calf with with straw just so the mother feels the baby is there and just the way it was done he saw the whole thing he said i can never drink milk again if you just seeing the way it actually done i can't drink milk again so the connection has to be made and when the connection is made it's very easy we do cho- we do tend to choose whether it's for your own health whether it's for your love for animals or whether it is for your love for the planet one way or the other the penny drops so the path of heart is being true to yourself you know have you have you noticed the word heart h e a r t contains the same letters as earth so the connection between heart and earth and the more we live from the intuitive state the presence of our heart we feel this natural oneness with all of existence and we do our best to go through this life with the least amount of harm of course nobody can completely you know in some sense we will no matter what we do there will be some harm but the least amount of harm by our thoughts by our words by our actions and then we hope that whatever little harm is created is also in the long run beneficial for for being like sometimes i've been criticized in my life but that's made me stronger and not always dependent on the validation of others that's been my journey and uh, i hope some of it was useful to you the practice i'd like to recommend for everybody is a practice called the brahma viharas the brahma viharas are four ways to educate your heart what are the four maitri karuna mudita and upeksha see the pali words the word sanskrit word actually maitri means loving kindness or loving friendliness the sense that all are my friends i've got no enemies karuna means compassion a sense that may all being be free from suffering mudita means appreciative joy rejoicing in the happiness of others their happiness is my happiness 
And upeksha means a balanced mind, not shaken by the pleasant and unpleasant, wanted and unwanted thing that happen in our life. The Buddha calls these four states the highest states of emotional intelligence, emotional well-being, and they are boundless states, which means that you, there is no limit to how much you can cultivate them. In fact, the Buddha even goes on to give you very concrete benefits of practicing the Brahma Viharas. For example, you sleep peacefully, you have pleasant dreams, you wake up without a sense of, you know, wanting to put the snooze button again and again. You you wake up bright and happy. Uh, as you go through your day, you're dear to human beings. You're even dear to non-human beings. I was going with some fellow monks to, a, we had this walking pilgrimage and we went to one particular monastery where we were shocked to find a deer came to greet us. And then the abbot, the head priest came and he welcomed us in. And we checked with him if he could spend the night. He said, yes. So later in the night, we were sitting with him and he said, do you know why I let you stay here? He said, no. He said, this deer was abandoned. His mother was killed uh, by some hunters. The little deer has been coming to my monastery from the time it was young. So I've taken care of this deer. And whenever visitors come, it does one of two things. It either runs into the forest or it goes to greet them. When it runs into the forest, I know not to trust those people and be wary of them. But when it goes to greet the people, I know these are trustworthy, reliable people. So because the deer came to you, I knew that you could be trusted. You were gentle, kind-hearted people. So I let you stay here. <laughs> so even in, uh, uh, just like some of you who have pets, your dog, your cat, they can pick up the vibes of people. So you're dear to non-human beings as well. And the Buddha goes on to say, when you practice loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity of mind, then fire, weapons, poisons don't harm you. And forget, of course, there are outer things, but what about the inner fire of hatred? What about the inner poison of jealousy, right? So, and weapons, the weapons of, you know, all the ways in which we hurt ourselves by self-criticism, for example. All of this starts diminishing. And very interestingly, we die, in a, as death approaches, we die in an unconfused state. These are very powerful blessings. And of course, the Buddha says at the end, if you penetrate no further, you'll either get fully liberated, which means you wake up from the illusion of being a separate being. You're, like, you're just pure being, you're not separate, actually. That's a little hallucination we have. Then you'll be born in a very conducive realm. So, as we practice these Brahma Viharas, Brahma, Brahma Vihara, Brahma is the highest being in the, in, the, in the realm of being, and Vihara is an abode. It's something that all of us can practice. So we develop our, we educate our heart with loving kindness, with compassion, with equanimity, and with appreciative joy. And I want to share something in Hindi, which I'll translate. Dukhi dek man karuna jage, aisa Brahma Vihar ho. Sukhi dek man mudita jage, Asa Brahma Vihar ho. Sabke Prati Maitri Jage Asa Brahma Vihar ho. Har Stiti Me Upeksha Rahe Asa Brahma Vihar ho. When you encounter someone who's suffering, the response of an awakened heart, a balanced mind, is compassion. When you encounter someone who's doing very well and they're successful and they're happy, instead of being jealous, the response of an educated heart an awakened mind, a calm mind, a balanced mind, is appreciative joy. Your happiness is my happiness. I'm so happy in your happiness. When you encounter anyone, human or non-human, the response is loving kindness, loving friendliness. All are my friends. I've got no enemies. In fact, when I lived in the forest, there was one chant we did every day, wishing peace and happiness to beings with no legs, to beings with two legs, to beings with four legs and to beings with multiple legs. And this is a chant the Buddha insisted all monks should do when they go to a forested region. He said, you make sure you practice this chant. Mamang apadako hingsi, mamang hingsi dipadako, mamang chatupado hingsi, mamang hingsi pahupado, sabbe pana, sabbe santu. So like this, you're, you're sending loving wishes to all these beings and monks who did this practice were never bitten by snakes. <laughs> so, as we, the response of a balanced mind to anybody is loving kindness. All are my friends, I've got no enemies.
but of course that doesn't mean you become gullible and naive you know how to deal with people in fact you're three steps ahead of them because the heart the intuitive mind is far more a uh, far more sharp than the cunning mind than the shrewd mind right there's a kind of intelligence there love is intelligence and finally when you encounter the ups and downs of life putta saloka dhamme hi chittam yasana kampati in the ups and downs of life which we will all encounter you'll have health and we'll have illness we'll have fame and we will be uh, you know on our reputation will be maligned we will have gain and loss happiness and sorrow these ups and downs are coming for all of us they've already come and they'll continue to come putta saloka dhamme hi chittam yasana kampati the mind does not tremble the mind is secure asokan kheman virajan etang mangalam uttamam this is the highest blessing says the buddha so like this as you go through life you will encounter people who suffer the response let it be compassion you will encounter people who are doing well appreciative joy i rejoice in your happiness you will encounter all kinds of beings inwardly i wish you happiness i wish you happiness and all the ups and downs of life this too shall pass this too shall pass when you educate your heart like this the quality of your entire life goes up and as the quality of your consciousness your life goes up everything evolves your tastes in the kind of movies you watch the kind of entertainment you have the kind of books you read the kind of uh, products you purchase or don't purchase and the food you eat the choice you make the vote you make with your every rupee and dollar all these things start aligning it's a dual journey of self realization and self actualization self realization is realizing i am undefinable any definition is bound to be false i just am and self actualization is the recognition i have infinite potentials not only infinite potentials but in the, in the, in the in the subtlest sense in the truest sense i am everything so one is the path of wisdom and one is the path of oneness and compassion and on this dual journey everything you do my teacher used to say no effort in the path of truth ever gets wasted so every little thing that we do has consequences is important the smallest little action wherever you are start from there we're not trying to get you to some very highly evolved state start from where you are start with a simple thought as you go through your day a simple thought i wish you happiness everyone you encounter instead of saying what can i get from this person how can i lighten their load everyone's carrying an invisible burden how can i lighten their load so that's the path with heart when i left my monastic life someone asked me uh, you know what is the essence and three things came to me deep listening deep love and deep silence these are the three ways that i summarize everything that i've learned to listen means to be in a state of love and silence to love means you're able to deeply listen and understand the other person's way of looking at the world and in a silence and silence is nothing but pure listening and pure love it's these three are mirroring each other and that for me is the essence of a path with heart so what i wanted to share with all of you i hope some of this was useful and helpful to you and may it brighten and lighten your path thank you